All right, so this video is for everybody, right? everybody who wants to have any understanding at all of uh, what proof of stake means um, should watch this video where we talk about uh, how it's defined at a high level and what are its key properties. So even if you never learn about sort of how it works under the hood, you should remember the properties that it has, which is what we'll talk about on this slide. The goal, remember, from last video is to have some way of doing civil resistant random sampling. So we'd like to randomly sample a node running the protocol in a way that no node can manipulate the probability with which it's selected, or at least no node can costlessly manipulate the probability with which it's selected. We saw one example of a civil resistant random sampling procedure back in lecture number nine when we talked about proof of work. So basically there nodes commit computational resources uh, to running the protocol. Uh, and here we're talking about a different approach uh, where nodes instead will commit directly economic resources. So in proof of stake, the high level idea is that any node that wants to contribute, maybe by proposing blocks or voting on blocks, any node that wants to contribute has to lock up some stake. So in blockchain protocols that use proof of stake civil resistance, the nodes that do this, the nodes that actually do lock up stake in order to propose uh, or vote, vote on blocks, they're generally called validators. And you can think of them as an analog to the miners um, that we had uh, that were creating blocks back in Nakamoto Consensus in lecture number nine. All right, so let me just now add a little detail around the words that I've put in quotes. Um, so here, stake, generally, um, that's going to be coins in the blockchain protocols uh, native currency. So the cryptocurrency, which is sort of uh, managed by that blockchain protocol. Now, it's not impossible to implement proof of stake civil resistance um, using some external cryptocurrency, using a cryptocurrency managed by, for example, some other, some other blockchain. Um, but it sure is convenient um, to implement staking with a protocol's native currency. And that's how it's uh, typically done. Furthermore, some blockchain protocols that use proof of stake civil resistance, including, for example, modern day Ethereum, um, use a technique known as slashing, which is basically taking funds away from misbehaving uh, validators. And for slashing to really um, have its full force, uh, you really kind of then need validators to be staking in the blockchain's native currency. The protocol has to actually have direct control over the currency in which the stakes uh, are denominated. So what do I mean by lockup? Well, proof of stake civil resistance, uh, it's used almost exclusively by blockchain protocols that support general purpose smart contracts. Okay, so that actual kind of computer in the sky um, that we talked about all the way back in lecture one. So Ethereum is the most canonical example of a blockchain protocol with general purpose smart contracts. Most of the other proof of stake blockchains you probably have heard of uh, also are in that category. Um, Bitcoin would be an example of a protocol that by design um, does not have general purpose smart contracts. By design, it has uh, more limited functionality. So given that, you know, generally when you're trying to implement proof of stake civil resistance, you have available general purpose smart contracts. It's just, it's really not that hard to write a computer program that manages deposits and withdraws um, from nodes that would like to enter or exit um, the set of current validators. And of course, with a, a general uh, smart contract, um, it's no problem to enforce various rules around what's allowed as far as deposits and withdraws. So for example, you know, this is where the lockup terminology comes in. Um, it's trivial to just say, okay, after you deposit, you have to wait at least two weeks before you can withdraw. And so that would just mean that actually it really, the funds really are in escrow for some meaningful uh, amount of time. So that's the basic idea of proof of stake. Uh, and the basic property that we want of our random sampling procedure is that a node should be selected with probability proportional to the amount of stake it has locked up. So the amount, for example, of native cryptocurrency, it has an escrow in this designated smart contract. Okay, so a random sampling procedure is such that for each node running the protocol, <coughs> a node is selected with probability uh, equal to the fraction of the state coins that it owns. And if you go back to lecture number nine, you will see this is literally exactly the defining property of proof of work, uh, except with hash rates replaced by staked coins. So this is the key defining property of proof of stake uh, random sampling. Uh, let's give this uh, uh, abbreviation. Let's call this property star.
All right, so that's the property that I claim that we want. One question is sort of, how do we get it? We'll talk a lot about that, especially in part two uh, of this lecture. Um, but let's talk a little bit more about why this is the property that we want. And so first of all, let's observe, this is the analog of corollary one from lecture number nine. Let's observe that if you have a random sampling procedure that meets this property star, that is in fact a civil resistant random sampling procedure. And so this property is immediate, right? If we just look at that uh, magenta equation, uh, you will notice that the right-hand side of that equation is independent of the number of IDs that node I is using. It doesn't matter how the node spreads its stake over various accounts. All that matters is the total amount um, of stake that it controls. Okay, so the right-hand side is independent of the number of IDs. Therefore, the left-hand side is as well. And that's exactly what civil resistance means. So it is true that a node can manipulate the probability that with which it's selected, but only by acquiring uh, and locking up additional stake. So that's the analog of corollary number one from lecture number nine. Um, next is going to be the analog of corollary number two from that lecture. So always when we're designing consensus protocols, we need to impose some kind of bound on the power of the adversary, like the power of the uh, of the Byzantine nodes. Um, and given this property, given uh, if we're going to be selecting nodes with probability proportional to stake, it's clear what that assumption on the adversary has to be about. It has to be an upper bound on the fraction of the stake uh, controlled by Byzantine nodes. And so in particular, if we assume that at most an alpha fraction of the stake is controlled by Byzantine nodes, then the property that any given output of this random selection procedure, the probability of it being a Byzantine node is at most that same upper bound alpha. And as we know um, from previous lectures with longest chain consensus, you generally start getting your guarantees once alpha is less than a half, once you have a strict majority um, of honest participation. And with BFT type protocols, usually you require the stronger condition um, that alpha is going to be less than a third. So throughout this lecture, when we're talking about proof of stake consensus protocols, we'll talk about both BFT style protocols. So there you should expect an assumption that less than a third of the stake is controlled by Byzantine nodes. We'll also discuss longest chain protocols. There you should expect the assumption to be that less than half of the stake is controlled by, uh, by Byzantine nodes. Now at this point, sort of all of you should be kind of saying, look, Tim, you know, pretty easy to just like write down a desired property on a slide the way I've done here. The real question is, can you actually implement this? And if so, how? How is a protocol going to somehow select leaders so that this property star uh, really is true? So we'll have a lot to say about that. Basically, all of part two of lecture 12 is going to be about exactly that. How do you implement random sampling procedures um, with this property? But before we get to that, uh, I do want to talk a little bit more about just sort of the motivation for proof of stake. After all, we already have a permissionless um, civil resistant uh, random sampling subroutine uh, in proof of work. Why isn't that good enough? Why might we want an alternative? So we'll talk about a few of the reasons in the next video. I'll see you there.